All right, guys, so today we are going to be looking at neutral tones, which is on page 11. And as always, I'm going to do a bit of context, a bit of um, for the poet and the time period. Then we'll look at the language and structure, and then we'll go stanza by stanza. All right. So this poem is written by Thomas Hardy. And Thomas Hardy was born in 18. 40 and died in 1928. That means that he was a Victorian writer. However, if some of you have already done a bit of your research, you will know that he was heavily, heavily influenced by Romanticism. And there's a couple of things in Romanticism that are key to distinguish a romantic writer. So I am going to tell you a few things that are key there. Victor, you have your hand up. Is that for a reason or not? I don't think so. Okay, there we go. So a few key things, if it is a romantic or if the person is a romantic writer or writing in the time of romanticism, there is usually a heavy feature of a dislike of urban life. Okay, so they feel a lot more good. I see you saying now they feel a lot more connected with the natural world, meaning that we will see a lot of natural imagery in their poetry or in their writing. Um, and as Zainab just pointed out, there is a strong love for the supernatural. And we see that in the poem quite often when he talks about God. Now we're going to get back to his life to see why that's an interesting fact. Um, and a last thing about romanticism is that it uses everyday ordinary language to discuss feelings, complicated feelings written through easy everyday language. Okay. So, um, and in the Victorian era and Victorian writing, we see a lot of hate towards the kind of modernization of the world, of the urban world. So there's kind of a mix between his romantic, um, his romantic inspiration and the Victorian writing that was influenced onto his own poetry. Okay, so let's look at a few things about Thomas Hardy himself. So he grew up in a very poor family in rural Dorset, meaning he was constantly living in the countryside. Now this changed throughout his life period as he moved back and forth between Dorset and London. He often had to move to London to follow his career as a writer because he was both a novelist and a poet. Now later in his life, and when we look back, um, he is much more known for his novels, but because we are studying a poem from him, we will be looking at the kind of natural imagery that he often used in poetry. Okay, so when he moved to London for his career, he despised it. He hated that urban living and therefore he often convinced his wife to move back to the countryside even though she was completely against it. Um, now we know from that kind of imbalance in their relationship, but also from a lot of other things that were going on, Thomas Hardy lived through a very unromantic and miserable marriage um, for a long period in his life. So this may have had a, in, an influence on his poetry. We can see that in some of the language being used, the negative language being used to describe a relationship, okay? The other interesting thing to think about is the fact that Thomas Hardy rejected religion um, in general. So he believed in the scientific findings that disproved an existence of God. And therefore, it becomes very interesting that he uses this religious imagery and the God references throughout the poem and what that could actually mean instead of using um, a strong religious background to influence his message. What was he actually doing with those God images in his poem, right? So um, a direct quote, and some of you might have seen this if you did a little bit of research 
is uh, from Thomas Hardy is during their brief transit through this sorry world, people should do what they want. Now, this was one of his comments on what he thought about marriage in particular, which kind of shows that he didn't like the confines of what traditional marriage looked like. Um, he felt kind of trapped in his own marriage, which probably gave him this negative view of what um, this romantic union felt like. Okay, so that is a little bit of background from um, this uh, poet. We also know that this particular poem was written in 1867. And because of the year and because of the content, a lot of the critics believe that this poem was about Eliza Nichols. Now, we cannot be sure. He never confirmed it. We don't know if it was just maybe a poem about general relationships. However, um, a lot of critics do think based on the content and based on the time in which it was written, that was who it was for. Um, we also have another poem in our anthology where a poet, we're not quite sure if this is the right person he was writing to, we do think so, the critics have found that, where they were talking about a challenging relationship. Does anyone know the poem that I am talking about? Lord Byron, very well done, uh, Jalen. So Lord Byron's poem, When We Two Parted, kind of discusses um, this very difficult relationship. We don't we can't confirm that it was about this woman, although critics say because of when it was written and because of the content, it was about her. Okay, so in general, this poem is about the ending of a relationship, okay? It is written in first person and we do not know because of it never being confirmed, whether it was a dramatic monologue or not. Now, some aspects of the poem do consist with that of a dramatic monologue, meaning that it is directed to someone. We see that when he's saying you and your, right? When he's using that direct address, which is something that a dramatic monologue always has and that we never hear back from the recipient of the poem. It's only one voice spoken and one word voice heard by the reader, which is another aspect of a dramatic monologue. But can anyone tell me if you've done your research or just in general why this might not be able to be confirmed as a dramatic monologue? Do we know? Why can we not say good, May, that it is a dramatic monologue? It is because it could be or it could not be a fictional character. He could be writing from his own perspective, which would not make it a dramatic monologue, or he could be taking on the voice of a fictional character. We're not sure. Um, a lot of critics say that this is clearly his own personal feelings to do with the relationship ending, but others say that he's taken on a voice. All right. So let's look at the title before we read through the poem for the first time. And let's think about um, the significance. Now, for those of you who have done your research, you will know that there is a very clear split between the two ways that you can read this poem, right? The two perspectives on this poem. Now, the title is quite ambiguous um, when we think about those two different types of analysis. Does anyone want to be unmuted and tell me what those two different perspectives were? Anybody know what the two different possible perspectives were about this poem? The word maybe neutral being key here. Zainab, the word neutral in the title shows indifference used to describe two lovers. So they've fallen so much out of love that has become plain, so neutral. Very good. So one perspective is that neutral, this kind of dull color, this dullness, this monotone um, aspect is showing that the two people in this relationship are not in love anymore or have fallen out of love. Lucia is even pointing out that it links to romanticism. Very good. Um, how could it link 
to another aspect which would change our reading of the poem. If anyone knows what existentialism is, good, there we go, Lucia. So if anyone knows what existentialism is, it is this idea that the universe does not care about our own singular feelings and therefore does not react and not, does not portray our emotions. Okay, um, Lucia, I am going to unmute you so you can explain what you just said. Wait, am I unmuted? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was doing some research on the poem a couple of weeks ago, specifically about the title, and it's sort of that it's a challenge towards romanticism, that instead of we should read so much into nature and so much into the symbolism, there is no symbolic meaning in that nature just sort of looks on, and with the religion that there isn't really, well, a controversial opinion, there isn't really a God, but it's just an, un an uninterested universe. Brilliant. Okay, so we have this idea that maybe you know, the universe doesn't care about this relationship. So that would mean that all of this neutral imagery and all of this kind of dead um, imagery that links to death and the color gray doesn't link to the lack of emotion. It links to how the care, the... Um, well, it links to how the universe and how the nature and how the environment does not care about the relationship. It is neutral, has no feelings towards a human connection. Okay, so those are the two different aspects. All right, so those are the two different readings and it's really important to think about that. Jalen, I'm gonna kind of repeat that because it's important when we go into reading the poem that we take into the two considerations. A lot of people analyze it saying that the color imagery and the use of the nature reflects their relationship coming to an end, like a winter's day or um, the last season being the ending of their relationship. Um, and then, Lily, you might have to share the link with her again, I'm not sure. Um, but then the other aspect is that maybe the surroundings, the nature just doesn't care at all. It is neutral towards their relationship. There is no significant kind of link between what is going on around them and them, okay? So that is the first thing that we need to think about, which kind of reading we wanna take as we go through. Now, thinking about the structure, you will see that it is a clear cyclical structure. And you'll see that when we go stanza by stanza, you'll see the words that actually make it a cyclical structure, the images that make it a cyclical structure. But it links to almost his feelings of this never ending memory that he's stuck in and this negative um, image he has of relationships and of love because of this one moment. We can also see the rhyme scheme, which is A, B, B, A, um, I might need to change this. Oh, there we go. A, B, B, A. Um, that is also a cyclical rhyme scheme, starting with A, ending with A, which shows us he kind of has no escape from this um, moment in his life or from this feeling in his life. So the rhyme scheme and the actual structure of the poem, the entire structure of the poem, reflect him feeling caught and trapped in this moment, caught and trapped in this emotion. Now the first three stanzas are about the moment itself, the event that took place. And the last stanza, the fourth stanza, looks at is looking back at that moment so it's written in the present time and looking back at that moment and we can see a few changes but essentially he's so obsessed with that moment that he's now in present time still reliving it um, that he takes comfort and regularity yes and he would have taken comfort in this relationship continuing even though it seems like there was no real affection but the fact that it ended seems to be one of the most painful moments for him because he can't seem to surpass it. All right, so you, when we're reading, I want you to take note of the fact that there is a lot of color imagery. There is a lot of use of pathetic fallacy. We will discuss whether we believe it's pathetic fallacy or not. 
Um, there's a few uses of archaic language, okay? And then there's a bunch of juxtapositions and oxymorons that I want you to look out for and think about how that links into everything we've discussed so far. All right, so first reading, as always, you are highlighting, underlining anything that stands out to you, any images that kind of give you the sense of the emotion he was feeling in that moment or is still feeling in present day time, or looking at any images that you think link to the fact that the environment or nature does not care about their relationship. Okay. <clears throat> we stood by a pond that winter day and the sun was white as though chidden of God and a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive, enough to have strength to die. And a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, key lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the God-cursed sun, and a tree, and a pond edged with grayish leaves. Okay, so let us start at the very beginning, and I want again to see you guys typing out your comments. Please, 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 if you feel like you are someone who wants to make a comment but you can't type fast enough, just say me and I will unmute you or I will look for your comment, all right? Okay, so we start off, we stood by a pond that winter day. Now this moment kind of tells us a lot about the relationship. It even starts off with the word we, which is a collective pronoun, almost starting the day off or the moment off as a collective. Good. Abby says winter symbolizes an ending and the cold harshness in the relationship. Mar Mariana says winter shows the emotional coldness. Very good. So this idea of winter being cold and emotionless and the final season kind of shows us that their relationship is coming to an end. Their relationship has gone cold. Good. Lucia says it stood stagnant, meaning there's been no change. It's just monotone. The relationship was lifeless and without movement. Very good. So it's standing there still. Okay. Um, anyone can, can anyone tell me any significance of the fact that there is a pond? Any idea why pond might link to even what Lucia was saying? Um, Lucia says the poem is passive, but that shows importance and bitterness. Good, that winter day. So it's specifically one moment in time that he's referencing. Mariana says the pathetic fallacy to represent the relationship falling apart. Very good in winter's day. Good, Lucia, there you go. So, and Abby pointed it out as well. The pond is still, it's stagnant. It's not moving just the, like their relationship. In other poems, we experience things like rivers and oceans, which are constantly moving and changing and running. But this is not, it's still not moving, not flowing like a river, like Madison said, very good. Um, so the nature in that moment is kind of exactly like their relationship. Now, again, I'm going to go through this poem analyzing the pathetic fallacy that might be there for example the pond reflecting the stillness in the relationship but you have to always remember that there is that alternative um, kind of analysis that is saying that the nature around them just doesn't care about their romantic relationship at all and therefore does not display any care for the ending of their relationship. So there's no movement around them. There's no life around them, not because it reflects the relationship, but because the life around them just doesn't care about their relationship. So those are the two different analysis that you can have. And the sun was white as though chidden of God. Ramesa says, the word sun is usually 
associated with life and joy. Here the sun is white and seemingly deprived of its power to warm a nature. Very good. So usually we think about the sun with the color yellow. Here we see it with the the color white. Lucia says white has connotations of purity, which juxtaposes jinn with by God. So good. So there we have another interpretation, which might be this idea of the purity of the nature around them, even though their relationship seems to be doomed by God. May says even the sun looks cold and monochrome, though that's meant to be the source of light, also shows significance of the ending on Winter's Day. Good. So there's it's colorless. There's nothing um, passionate within their relationship. Um, good. And definitely it is a metaphor. Uh, Mariana says that the white represents the hope and it is color imagery. Good. We're going to have a lot of color imagery in this poem. So make sure you're hide highlighting all of it, maybe with a specific highlighter color so you can look back on it. Good. So there is a lack of love, a lack of passion there, as though Chidden of God, as though makes that last part a simile. Um, Chidden is actually an archaic term. Now, of course, we good. May, there we go. So it's a 12th century um, word. It was used way, way before Thomas Hardy was writing. It wasn't used frequently in his time period. Um, be careful to call all of this archaic just because it's old for us doesn't mean it's archaic. It has to be old for the time that he was writing it. So this word chidden means rebuked, right? Kind of pushed away by God as though he disowns the sun or feels no connection to the sun sent away he sends the sun away right so he their relationship seems doomed from the very beginning of the poem right then we say and a few leaves lay on the starving sod and i think the most interesting um part of that line is are the words starving sod very good, Mariana. So it is personification. Obviously, the sod cannot be starving. And as Sephora just mentioned, it is also sibilance. Ramessa says the grounds is as starving and unhappy as a speaker and the leaves are dead and seem almost forgotten by the indifferent winter. Good. So Ramessa has actually pointed out again the two different annotations here. So the falling of the dead leaves could show that the nature around them doesn't care about their relationship, isn't trying to help them win their passion and their romance back. It is dying around them. Or it could show again that their relationship is falling apart. And Mariana says that the sibilance in the S sound of starving and sod could link to almost the sinister tone of their relationship coming to an end. And yes, May, you are very much correct. There is a very clear lexical field of death throughout this poem as well, not just in the first stanza, but she's linking it to a word that comes in the next line, which is they have fallen from an ash and were gray. Now, ash is a tree, but again, he's obviously picked this particular tree to maybe link to death and things burning and falling apart and coming to an end. Um, Starving again shows that there's a lack of something, maybe a lack of passion in their relationship. Kyla says the color imagery, the color gray shows the neutralness of their relationship, the neutrality and dullness in their relationship. Very good. And we actually see the color gray um, at the very end of the poem, which creates this cyclical structure. Um, good. Ramessa says the fact that the ash trees are there could also symbolize growth and that would help show that something is growing and there is life around them even if their relationship is dying. Good. Gray shows indifference of the universe and the nature. Yes, there is no life in the nature. The nature doesn't seem to be wanting to nurture this relationship or help this relationship grow. Okay. So that is our first stanza. It's very cold, very filled with death, very indifferent. Jalen says, could the ash be related to death like cremation? Very good. So it's like the death of their relationship, the cremation of their relationship. Good. All right, let's move on to stanza two. 
Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago. Who has something to say about that line? I'm going to just read Cheyenne's um, statement about the ones before. Ash can't be remade into anything. It can symbolize that the relationship is dying and not able to be fixed again. Good. So that is the end. And we know that it will never be resurrected. Good. Alicia says, in love poems, eyes are normally to be positive features, but it's negative in this poem. Good. There is no life, it seems to be, in her eyes. Um, it seems that she's looking at him as if he were just a deadly image of their relationship, something that bores her. Um, Alicia, oh, sorry, Mariana says the repetition of eyes. Good, yes. So, and that might link to what Lucia says, that eyes are seen as the window into the soul. But in this case, that window into the soul shows that their souls are disconnected. Good where the connection is lost, says Lucia. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove to wander, keep moving. Good, so it's almost like she's already moving on from that relationship. And the way she looks at him as, is as if it's a tedious task, okay? Something that bores her, something that st stresses her, not something that creates love or passion inside her. Sapora so says, when something roves, it has no fixed destination and could signify how she has lost connection with him. Good. So she's moving on. She's looking past him, continuing to look for something new, something better. Okay. And some words played between us to and fro on which lost the more by our love. So they're having a conversation back and forth, but really just very minimum conversation. Good. Yeah, Allison says that play could suggest some kind of cheating. Yeah, it's almost like it's a game between the two of them. It's not a, a passionate relationship. It's just a game that is being tossed back and forth between them. But it's very minimum, okay? And every word is kind of losing the love that they had. Lucia says played relationships are pointless and trivial, similar to what Sephora was saying. Yeah, good. So... Again, it's this idea of it's a game and when it's over, it's over. It's not a connection that will last them a lifetime. <clears throat> so lost, you can also link to what you guys were saying, May pointed out, like this lexical field of death, this lexical field of losing something in your life, something falling away from you, um, like their relationship is falling apart. Um, all right. So, uh, Mariana says the fourth line, the more words were said, the more broken the relationship got. Yeah, so the conversation wasn't actually helping them. The communication was actually hurting them, probably because they had already lost that emotional connection. All right, the smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive, enough to have strength to die. Good, May. So the oxymoron of the deadest thing alive, oxymoron means that they're complete opposites put together, shows he may fear loss, but acknowledges the relationship was over. Any other conflicts can be supported by the deadest thing alive and grin of bitterness. Good. So there is a clear um, acknowledgement that their relationship is dead. Her smile is dead, even though that is what the opposite of what a smile should bring. Lucia says words are personified, which denotes the lack of communication. Um, yeah, so that I think you're referring to the fact, and some words played. Good. So this is the death of the relationship. Superlative, the word deadest. Good, because we have that extremity, right? Coldest, deadest smile and deadest are juxtaposing words so we have a lot in that stanza of juxtapositions and of oxymorons we see another one right afterwards of the grin of bitterness right those are not two words that we would likely put together but it seems like they two the two of them in that relationship don't fit together they're contrasting they don't work together and because of this contrast their relationship was doomed from the start lucia says alive enough can portray that the smile chose to die 
maybe she chose to lose a love, a hint of blame and bitterness. Yeah, so here we go. Um, she seems to have the energy to give something like a grin of bitterness or a smile, which shows that she might have had the energy to fix the relationship, but doesn't seem to want to do that. And that could show that the narrator feels that she is to blame for the end of this relationship. Good, Alison points out that alive and die are again a juxtaposition and they symbol their love dying. Zipporah so has moved on and is looking at the ominous bird, a wing, shows that nature is running away and doesn't care. Very good. So this bird is flying away. Omnius shows that their relationship was doomed from the start, right? They had no chance of surviving. Or like Sapora points out, nature is running away, flying away, doesn't care to stay and try to make this a romantic moment for the couple. Mia says their relationship has been drained so much a smile is dull. Yeah, so the thing that we think shows gratitude or shows love or shows affection, even that has been frozen and killed. Eva pointed out that birds have a lot of superstition, yes, and especially linked to death. And this might tell us that even he in that mo moment knew again that there was death of their relationship coming. Right, I'm going to read out what May just said. Also, there's anaphoric use of the collective. Okay, we're going to get you. Hold on, May. I'll unmute you in a second so that you can explain the repetition of the use of and. Okay, good. Paradox of weakness, strength to die, right? So we don't usually think about someone having the strength to die, but it seems that might link to what you guys were saying, that she chose to have that relationship die. Okay, so we then look at the very last stanza. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face. And the God-cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. Good, so couple of things before we look at that. Um, Jaylin has pointed out that birds can also be linked to love, yes, and freedom even. So it could be like their love is flying away. Or maybe that they feel like they're setting themselves free from this kind of all encapsulating relationship, all consuming relationship. A death and decay because leaves are green and not gray. Good, so we see that gray image at the end again, which makes us a cyclical poem. We have Mariana pointing out that the God cursed sun. Again, we have that religious imagery. Does anyone want to attempt an analysis before we look at something else of why he's using this chidden of God and this God cursed sun if he didn't believe in religion at all why would he use that image if it didn't really mean a lot to him anyone have a guess i know that's a bit tricky no why would he use imagery okay good alicia says it's pessimistic yeah and maybe it links to this idea as what Lucia is saying that love is pointless and that humans see themselves as a lot more important than they are. Now, if you want to do a little bit more um, research on existentialism, the word that we typed in before Lucia typed it in, um, this idea that the universe does not care about singular humans and that humans think they're a lot more important than they are. So maybe um, Thomas Hardy was kind of mocking a little bit this end of relationship and how exaggerated the voice is there that he thinks that God would care or curse their relationship or that something supernatural would care or the universe would care even though he's kind of pointing out that seems that nobody cares. Madison says he thinks God is not based on truth like romanticism. Very good. So we go into this idea that he is a romant, well, he's inspired by romanticism. He's looking at the supernatural power, but also it seems that nothing um, really cares about their relationship. 
Mariana says the poem ends as it begins. Could it suggest that he's not over it yet? Good. So that's going into this idea of a cyclical structure, right? He's stuck in this moment. He's not over how that moment felt. It seems that he is maybe over her as a relationship, but not over what that moment made him feel. There is a slight change, however, if you see that it goes from being gray in the first stanza to gray-ish at the end. And I saw someone say something about that a second ago. Um, let me see if I can find it. Gray-ish. So Allison says, the relationship isn't dead yet. Now, this is interesting. It seems that the relationship is completely dead, but maybe the, mo the memory of it or the emotion behind it isn't completely gone for him. That's why it's gray-ish. But also maybe that this memory is slowly fading slightly or he's trying to remember exactly how it felt. So those words are being shifted slightly from how they actually happened in that moment. So it was gray, now it was gray-ish, okay? First it was chidden of God and now it's fully cursed by God. Lucia says our perception changes, good. So, and our perception changes not just um, based on our environment or our internal states, but also over time, right? So over time, we kind of move on from a moment or our memory of a moment kind of switches or um, shifts slightly. So maybe that's why it was great at the beginning and by the end, it's just gray-ish. Romesa says that the cyclical nature of time and the passing season is good. So it's kind of that change of season. Jalen says, could it be that he's slowly starting to feel better? Yeah, we could say that even though he is stuck in that moment, it seems that there is kind of a, a little bit less pain. So the leaves will eventually be green. Yeah, maybe when it turns into summer again, when that moment turns away from winter, that the trees and the leaves and the nature might again sprout and grow. However, Remember that he says that one, the lesson he learned from this moment is that love deceives, right? So he has this very negative view on love that he can't seem to get rid of. He always pictures her face when he tries to move on to a new relationship. Um, so Pora says, after winter, it's spring, which symbolizes growth. Yeah, very good. And especially because, again, it could show that nature doesn't care it moves forward even if the relationship doesn't move forward the world will continue to heal isabel says maybe he thinks of her more at a certain time of the year yeah maybe the winter and the the coldness there brings back moments and memories of her but also it seems that every time he tries to move on he sees her face and feels this moment the repetition of the w sound yeah um, we see that throughout that last stanza. Sound, uh, sounds portrays his difficulty of expressing himself. Yeah, it seems like he almost has this melodic ring in his mind. Uh, maybe of could be like Lucia says, showing he's finding it difficult to express the emotion he was feeling. Or maybe it's because this song, this melody of pain continues to play in his head. Right, I'm going to unmute May because she said something earlier that I want you to all to hear about the repetition of and. And if you look at the poem, the word and is actually repeated about 11 times throughout the whole thing. And this is not something we always look at. I'm sure your teachers have often said in the past, don't analyze the word and. However, the word and is not very common in poetry, especially romantic poetry, um, but we see it anyways so often and it helps us understand the tone and it helps us understand that he's still trapped in this moment. So, May, what can you tell us? So, he uses an anaphora with the word and, and as you said, it's repeated 11 times in total. So it could show the narrator's emotions, which we think to be him, as like fear or anger, or even it could just like state the fact that the relationship has carried on longer than it was meant to. And we can say that it was also like deliberate because and isn't considered poetic at all. 
and we can imagine someone complaining using the repetition of and so it's definitely showing his negative emotions and we could also say that it shows the uncomfortable repetition and the structure of the relationship because it's used consistently throughout the whole thing but it doesn't actually create a nice image okay. brilliant so uh may where do we often see this and 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 at the beginning of the lines but just in general in life i mean where do we see that where do we hear that often someone repeating and 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 oh when they're angry and they're listing things to be annoyed about yeah good so i'm gonna mute you perfectly said may so he consistently uses this and 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 as if he's listing all the negatives in their emo uh, in their relationship and as may pointed out it shows that he's frustrated or he's having an outburst of anger almost like a child um when they tell a story or retell a story and then i was there and then she said this and then i went so it almost feels like he's stuck in this anger now this is a really good um, example to use if you want to show your examiner that you understand the other interpretation which is that the world doesn't care um so um Jaylen, that is the idea that um the repetition of and okay shows his frustration because he's listing all of these negative moments and negative kind of words and images and it's almost like he can't contain his anger and that would juxtapose the title and the color imagery which shows this kind of neutralness um this starvation of any kind of passion but at the same time this and 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 and, and shows his anger which in a sense shows his passion for this moment, for this relationship, that he might not have been ready to let it go. And it kind of links to what Lucia was saying of placing blame on somebody else, like a child saying, and, 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 when you are trying to refer to something somebody did to you or a moment where you felt wronged. Okay, so this links to his passion for the moment, which juxtaposes the neutralness of the nature around them. Lucia says, it could show that he's rejecting the fact that poetic moments in life are unrealistic, hence his constant lack of color. Good. Love is futile. Love doesn't have that poetic, passionate love that so many people wrote about. Hannah says, maybe he's trying to make it last longer. Yeah, almost like he doesn't want to let go. And so he's listing this moment. And even if he does want to let go, he can't let go. The moment has impacted the way he views love. Okay. So the way that he thinks about love has kind of shifted because of this one moment in time, this moment by the pond. And even that pond image being referred to in the very last line shows us that still nothing has changed. It's still kind of subdued and not moving. Mariana says a tree is a symbol of life. Very good. And a tree and a pond edge with grayish leaves. So there is life happening all around them, yet their relationship has died. Okay, so there again is a juxtaposition there. Or you can see that maybe there's a slight sense of hope, like some of you were mentioning, that soon his luck will change and there will be more poetic, beautiful, passionate moments in his future. Alusia says this was one of his last poems before quitting poetry. Yes. Um, very much so and that could link to what you were saying before that he felt a lot of these romance poems looked at an unrealistic picture of what love is supposed to be like um which can denote that this may not be a dramatic monologue yeah it could be a dramatic monologue he could be taking on a character or this could be his own opinion on love we know that he had a very horrible relationship with his wife for a very long time um, and that he felt like he should be able to do whatever he wanted. But then at the same time, this shows us a very kind of horrible and heartbreaking memory that someone carries with them throughout life and can't seem to get rid of. And maybe the consistency of the lines, because there's always four lines in each of the stanza, maybe it shows us that there is this constant reminder of something happening that he can't live past that winter day could it be that nothing really happened before or after and that he only specifically remembers that day yeah 
And it is actually um, thinking about the fact that that one precise moment is what he remembers of the relationship, not what happened before, not what happened at afterwards, but that one cold moment where she smiled at him and he knew that their relationship was over, was dead. That was the um, kind of initial moment where he maybe realized that his relationship was doomed. Good, four stanzas, four lines, good. So Lucia's making a point here that 444 is the angel's number. We know um, devil has his number, so he has 444 is the angel's number, which could show some kind of hope. I would say it's a little bit of stretch, but it might be interesting to think about how um, that could link to his idea of, support points out, yeah, and four seasons how it links to his idea of kind of criticizing maybe religion. It's almost like a mockery. Like if there is a God who is supposed to shine down on us, then why is he feeling this way? And why is his love dying? And nobody seems to care, right? Um, it's almost like God curses love um, for the narrator in this poem. Right. So what I'm going to ask us to do is for you all to start and everyone, hopefully you've turned your chat to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see this. Let's start writing out any of the um, themes that we see being explored in this. Ramesa says memory. Good. Alicia says pain. Cheyenne says death and nature. Very good. Anger, religion, loss, hope, desperation, complicated feelings. Anna says anger again, good. Coldness, light, good. Reality, frustration, separation, very good. Think about also emotional distance because that's going to help us compare it to other poems we've already seen. Think about nature. That's going to help us link it to poems we already see. Loss of love, good. Kyla says passive aggressiveness. Yes, very good. So it's almost like he's blaming someone, but not really blaming them fully. Good. We also see a lot of obsession here, maybe unwanted obsession, but obsession of that moment of that memory. Um, bitterness, good. Rejection of society, rejection of religion, good. Rejection of social expectations, of that religious belief. Right, okay, anybody willing? Let's see some names out there that haven't spoken yet. Anybody willing to tell me what poem they would compare it to and why? Let's see someone who's never spoken up before or someone who's never unmuted themselves before. Be brave. Okay, I'm gonna find you, Sapora. Right, Sapora, can you hear us? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, tell us why Love's Philosophy. Um, I would probably say Love's Philosophy because in Love's Philosophy, it talks about um, how nature wants them to be together and um, talks about it's in an argumentative form. Good. And you could kind of say with the um, ands in neutral tones, it could suggest an argument, even though it kind of seems like he's arguing to himself to try and prove a point, which is kind of similar to Love's Philosophy. Very good. So we have, well done, Sephora. So we have a lot of nature being used here, almost like an argumentative structure, like you're trying to convince someone or tell someone. Um, I am going to get to Jalen. So we had Love's Philosophy um, from Sephora. Let me find Jalen. All right. Jalen, on you. By when we two parted? Um, I would say when we two parted because there's a lot of links to it, like nature and like the seasons, especially like yeah. the way he talks about it. And also just the, frus the frustration and like blaming the other person as well. I feel like that's quite similar as well. Good. And I can't remember what my other point was. Yeah, that's perfect. Well done. Okay, so looking at nature, looking at blaming someone else in a relationship, looking at a relationship coming to an end, falling apart, right? So we see a lot of that. Um, now I'm going to unmute Chloe for our last one. 
Chloe, can you explain to us why winter swans? Um, because it's an unhappy relationship with heavy, they're very like unhappy relationships with heavy uses of nature imagery, but um, one of them ends positively and this one ends negatively. They also, yeah, keep going, yeah. They also both use pathetic fallacy throughout it, um, so you can talk about that. And even religious imagery, right? Okay, so yeah. perfect. So it's really good to pick poems that have a lot of similarities, but then also have some key differences so that when you are writing your essay, you can highlight the similarities and the differences that are happening. As Chloe just pointed out in Winter Swans, we kind of see a neutrality of a relationship or the negative aspects of a relationship through the use of nature, through the religious imagery, but then by the very end in Winter Swans, it transforms into a positive, right? When they come back together and their wings are connected, whereas, or their metaphorical wings. And then in this poem, we see that that death of the relationship has happened and that they are no longer together. Mia says, in Winter Swans, the relationship can be saved and the nature saves it, but in neutral tones, the relationship is so helpless that nature doesn't care about it. There's no passion, beautifully said. So in one, nature seems to be caring about their relationship and inspiring them to become passionate again and romantic again. Whereas this, in this poem, it is the complete opposite. Nature kind of has this very pessimistic effect on them. It's cold, it's heartless, doesn't seem to care about their relationship. All right, guys, so that is neutral tones. Um, that will be the last specific poem that we go on, uh, go through word for word. Now I'm going to 